So we're going to be talking about blowing up an algebraic variety at a point. I'm not assuming that you, you have any particular background in algebraic geometry, by the way. So I'm going to spend some time introducing all the relevant terms we need to define the blow up and, and understand what it does. And I'll talk through one example of blowing up a, a nodal curve. OK, so throughout K is going to be a field. Uh, AN, affine space, just means KN. And PN is projective space. So projective space is the equivalence relation on tuples, non-zero tuples of numbers from the field. With the relation that they lie on the same line. That is, there exists a non-zero lambda such that bi is equal to lambda bi prime. for all i. OK, so this is projective space. So projective space is the space of lines through the origin in a n plus 1. Because note that the points so let me draw the correspondence between lines and points in two dimensions. So if you take a point that's not the origin, say 1 lambda, well, any point that's not the origin, there's a unique line that passes through that point and the origin. And all the points on that line are, of course, proportional to 1 lambda. So that line L, you can identify the line L with the equivalence class of that point inside P2. P1. Okay, so in algebraic geometry, uh, AN and PN aren't just sets. They're given a topology called the Zariski topology that I'll only refer to somehow obliquely at a few points where it matters. Uh, they're also equipped with what's called a sheaf of functions, which merely says that for every open subset in that topology, uh, we specify some collection of functions taking values in the field, which are somehow allowed. And that determines the morphisms between these objects in a suitable category. Uh, none of that is particularly relevant for today. Uh, so for us, uh, affine space and projective space are just these sets. And affine varieties and projective varieties are subsets of AN and PN respectively cut out by polynomial equations. I have to introduce this because uh, the blow up will be cut out by equations inside some affine space. Yeah, there's a bit of a disagreement 
about whether varieties should be irreducible. Uh, I'm actually of the opinion that when I say variety, it should mean something irreducible, if you know what that means. Uh, but for today, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. We, we adopted the convention in MAG that uh, a variety is just a, a closed subset, subset, not necessarily irreducible, and I'll, I'll stick with that. Okay, so if we take some polynomial equations, f1 through fr, with coefficients in the field and n variables, then I can evaluate such a polynomial on a point of a n, and v, bold v, of f1 through fr means the set of all simultaneous zeros of all of those functions. Right? So that's an affine variety. A projective variety. So this is more interesting. Uh, we have to... Because the, the points of, of Pn aren't just tuples, right? They're lines. So how do we make a polynomial function well-defined on a line? Well, you can't, <laughs> unless it's zero. But it does make sense. You can have a well-defined vanishing set of homogeneous polynomials. Okay, so let me explain. How do we, so I'm explaining how to cut out subsets of Pn with polynomial equations. Suppose I give myself some collection of homogeneous polynomials. So a homogeneous polynomial is something which every monomial in which has the same degree. So for example, uh, y0 squared, y1 plus y2, y3, y4. Every monomial here has degree 3, right? So that's homogeneous. Whereas y0 cubed plus y0 plus 2. Uh, that monomial has degree 3, that has degree 1, that has degree 0, so no. And this has got nothing to do with monomial orders or anything like that, as we discussed in MAG. This is just, just purely counting the, the sum of all the exponents in each monomial. And if they all match, it's homogeneous. And if there's any mismatches, it's not. Uh, zero is homogeneous. So given homogeneous polynomials, as I'll, I'll do a little calculation in a moment and convince you that the following is actually well-defined. So by writing that, yeah, maybe I should write L instead of P, right? Just to make this point. The question is, what does this even mean? Right? Uh, it does seem like if I feed different points in the line into the polynomial, I'll get different numbers. Uh, and that's true, and this notation maybe is a, is a bit misleading, but uh, let's do a little calculation and, and see that it's mild. Okay, so if G is homogeneous of degree D, I see. i.e. there are some coefficients g sub a in k such that little g can be written as a sum of monomials whose total weight total degree is d, and by by this here what I mean is a0 plus dot 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 a n is equal to d. Okay, so that's what it means for g to be homogeneous. If it is homogeneous, and we're given two points, say p, p prime, which belong to the same line l in p n, 
Okay, so let's say P is uh, B0 through Bn. P prime is as before, B0 prime through Bn prime. And let's say Bi is lambda Bi prime. Well, what's G of P prime? That means substitute in B0 prime for Y0 and so on. Oh, I did it the wrong, wrong way around, didn't I? I'm just going to change my mind about where the lambda lives. Of course, it doesn't matter. There's some non-zero lambda, right? So that's lambda b0, lambda bn. Hopefully you see where this is going. Okay, so that's lambda to the d, right? Because of this. That comes out the front, and what's left is just g of p. Okay, therefore, g of p is equal to zero if and only if g of p prime is equal to zero. So, gl equals zero is well defined. If G is homogeneous, then it vanishes on a point of a line, if and only if it vanishes on all of them. And that's what we mean when we say that G vanishes on the line. Okay, so with that in mind, given homogeneous polynomials G1 through GR, the definition on the left-hand board makes sense. I can cut out some subset of Pn uh, using such vanishing conditions. Uh, these, these are the closed sets in a topology. So the sets that appear on, on the board here are subsets of AN and PN respectively. They form a topology um, called the, the closed sets of a topology called the Zariski topology. That's kind of a passing comment. Uh, but it'll probably come up when I answer questions, so it's worth remarking. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. So now let's define the blow up. First, let me pause to change the time of day because it's very bright. Okay, the blow-up, the way to motivate it is just to think about this relationship between a point in AN and the line that connects that point to the origin. That line lives in PN minus 1. And all the pairs consisting of a point and the line that it lies on, uh, that's essentially what the blow-up is, or it's how you define the blow-up. So that's what I'm about to explain, but it's, it's no more complicated than that. So this product has as its underlying set, just the Cartesian product of sets. Uh, if you've read an algebraic geometry text, you'll know that defining Cartesian products of varieties uh, properly, that is to give it the right topology and the right sheaf of functions is a little bit involved. Uh, 
we don't need to worry about that. But you do need to know what counts as a subvariety, right? What what kind of equations am I allowed to use to cut out subsets of this, uh, which is essentially the question of defining the topology. So let me answer that question because it's going to be uh, sort of relevant. So the relevant subsets that we're allowed to talk about are simultaneous zeros of sequences of polynomials okay so I'm going to call the coordinates on a n x1 through xn and the coordinates on pn minus 1 I'll call them y1 through yn. So remember this thing sits inside a n. Well, not sits inside, it's it's constructed from a n by a quotient, right? So this is a n with the origin removed, modulo some relation. Okay, we're there and there, and the fi are homogeneous in the y variables. No constraint on the x variables. Okay, so for example, uh, x1 squared y0 plus x2 y1 is fine because each monomial has degree 1 in the y variables. The total degrees are not the same, but we don't care about the x's. Just treat them as constants for the purposes of determining whether this thing is homogeneous or not. Okay. What that means is that uh, the vanishing sets of these this kind of polynomial is a well-defined thing on a n cross p n minus 1 for the same reasons as we just discussed. If one if such an equation vanishes on a pair consisting of a point of an and a line in pn minus 1, or rather any point on a line in pn minus 1, then it vanishes on all such points. So if f is homogeneous in y's, then for p, p prime, points in a line, or what's the same, they're equivalent under the equivalence relation. Oh, let me just call them Q, sorry. So I can evaluate f on pq in the obvious way. Right? p is just a tuple of n numbers, substitute them for the x variables. q is just a tuple of n numbers, substitute them for the y variables. That will be 0 if and only if f p q prime is 0. And when that happens, we'll just say that f p l is zero, where l is the equivalence class of p and the equivalence class of p prime in p n minus one. All right. So then the, the vanishing set of such a polynomial makes sense, and that's the things in a n cross p n minus one that we're allowed to talk about. So that's it for background. Now we're prepared to uh, talk about the subset of this Cartesian product, which is the incidence relation that I was just describing. So 
So pick a point, not at the origin. That lies on a unique line through the origin. And consider all such pairs. So that's a subset of it's written that way. It's a subset of an minus one with zero removed cross with pn minus one. That's just the graph of the quotient map. Right. Remove the origin that sits inside. Pn minus 1 is the quotient of that by an equivalence relation. So let pi be the map that sends a point to its equivalence class. And the map I the set I just wrote down, all these PLs, is simply the graph of that function. Okay, so the question that we're now going to turn to is how to cut this out with the equations. This is a nice little exercise. We know what it means to cut things out with equations given the previous board, right? I need to produce some polynomials, homogeneous in the y variables, such that the set of joint solutions of all those polynomials are exactly those sequences of 2n numbers, or rather points and lines, which satisfy this incidence relation. That is, the, the pair is a point and the line that it lies on. Okay, well, let P be a point, and L be a line, with representative Y's, then P lies on the line, or more precisely, pi of P is in the equivalence class L. Uh, or rather is equal to L, right? If and only if, by definition, there exists a lambda non-zero such that for all i, xi is lambda yi. Okay, so let me just massage this a bit. Divide through by xi, which is non-zero, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, not all i's are non-zero, right? Yeah, I should have thought about this more carefully. Um, okay, so... We'll divide into two cases, all right? So consider this equation for some i. If xi is zero, then that just says lambda yi is zero. And lambda is non-zero, so it just says yi is zero. If xi is non-zero, then we can divide through by it. So Let's say it like this, for all i, either xi is 0 and yi is 0, or xi is non-zero 
and yi on xi is equal to lambda. Yeah, I'm tempted just to assume all the coordinates are non-zero. Uh, doesn't doesn't really change what I'm going to say, but I just have to explain more, and I, I don't think it's really the point. So. Just for the sake of right now, uh, I mean, you can check that you can go from the first line to the last line without this intermediate stuff, but it, it sort of breaks the conceptual story a little bit. And uh, so I'm just going to, to proceed for such p's, just to motivate the equations a bit more clearly. Okay, so I hope we agree on that, right? So divide through by the x size. But then you see that since this value lambda is independent of i, to say there exists a lambda for which this is equal to, um, that these are all equal, is the same as to say that for all i and j, these ratios are equal. Okay, so we just eliminate lambda. And then we get our equations by just clearing denominators. Okay, so these are the equations we're going to use to define the blow up. So notice they're homogeneous in the y variables, right? Okay, uh, I guess we've run out of room on those boards, so we're going to move to the next set. Any questions? Okay, so definition. The blowing up of a n at zero is the variety I'll call it B L zero A N, which is the vanishing set of Maybe I don't need this name i later, so I'll just write the equations. So the collection of equations that we take are the ones we just defined. So x i y j minus x j y i, where i and j range over all pairs. It's redundant, as you can see, but that's all right. Inside that space. So what does the blow-up do? Well, those equations precisely say that uh, 
well, where I sort of I took a step here, right? Um, maybe I should remark on that. Yeah, this I skipped over something. So let me just let me just preface this definition with uh, with something on the next board because we were talking about the situation where p was uh, was not zero, right? Okay, so these are homogeneous in the y variables, as I said. Okay, so we take the vanishing locus of all those polynomials, we get a closed subset of a n cross p n minus 1. And by the discussion earlier, when we take that vanishing set and we intersect it with the open subset where we don't allow the point to be zero, when we do that, that's just the, the set we had before that we were considering. Right, so if p is not zero and these equations are satisfied for a pair pl in a n cross p n minus one then the equations just say that p lies on l so what's new in the blow up beyond what we've already discussed is what happens at the origin so if all the x's are zero then look at the equations, they're all automatically zero. So I imposes no constraint. The equations in I impose no constraint on the Y variables. Which is to say that if you take the point zero, every point in projective space everything in this Cartesian product is a solution of all those equations. So that is a subset of the blow up. Okay, to come back to the definition now. So the blow up is a set of all solutions to those equations in AN cross PN minus one, which is a disjoint union of the two pieces I just described. So we're going to talk about examples and, and draw some pictures in a moment. Uh, but notice that this component here, so I want to point out that this here is really just a n with zero removed. Right, so this first component of the union sits inside B. What, what is in, in the notes, B is the blow up. Maybe Edmund just add B equals BL zero AN to the definition. Uh, so you don't have to keep writing it differently to what's in the notes. Yep. So B sits inside AN cross PN minus one. And there's the projection map from that down to AN. And inside AN sits AN with zero removed. This diagram commutes where the left-hand side sends PL to P. 
And it's easy to see that that's a bijection. In fact, it's an isomorphism of varieties. And the proof is simply that uh, P determines the line. You don't have to write that in, it doesn't fit. Uh, but I hope that's clear. So this subset of the blow up, this open dense set, uh, consists just of something that looks like a n cross, I mean, a n with zero removed. So what we say in algebraic geometry is that this map from b to a n, uh, which is sort of implicit there, right? b inside a n cross b n minus one and down to a n. Uh, maybe you can draw that diagonal line for me, Edmund, from b down to a n. Yeah, so that map there, we say it's birational because it induces an isomorphism from a dense open subset of the domain uh, to a dense open subset of the codomain. All right. Okay, my iPad is here and working, so thanks, Edmund. Um. So blowing up a subvariety. So that's that's it for blowing up a n. The blow up is this subvariety of a n cross p n minus one b l zero a n. But that's not very interesting. So let y be a subvariety. Containing zero. Let phi be the map that Edmund just wrote in. We call that map the blow up. Right, so B is BL zero A N. The blow up of Y at zero. Noted BL zero Y is the closure of the pre image of Y with zero removed in B. Now, this is a bit subtle, right? So we first remove the origin from Y, and then we take the pre image in the blow up, and then we close it again once it's there. Now this closure is in the Zariski topology, which means that you can't really understand it properly unless you understand the Zariski topology, which is outside the scope of, of today's talk. But we don't have to because the closure in the, the Zariski topology is coarser than the usual topology if k is equal to. Um, so if k is equal to r or c, This is coarser, that is, contains fewer open sets than the usual topology. What do I mean by the usual topology? Well, B sits inside A n cross P n minus 1. And A n is just k to the n, and P n minus 1 is some quotient. So in the case where k is r or c, you know an alternative topology on r n, c n, and any quotient of those spaces by an equivalence relation. The quotient topology will do. Okay, so give this space the usual topology in those cases. And then the closure I'm talking about right now will in particular contain the closure in that topology. And that's what I'm going to use to argue for what the blow up looks like. Okay, so basically it'll just justify working in a somewhat informal way uh, that's justified by, by the remarks I just made. Okay, so here's the diagram. That comes a bit later. Uh, yeah, maybe. So we start with the blow up. Y sits inside a n, remove the origin, then take the pre image. Right? That's this here. Then take the closure in B. That's this thing. 
Now, by construction, there's a commutative diagram like that. And with a little bit of argument, you can see that actually the closure of the pre-image uh, factors through y. And that's got to do with uh, irreducible sets and, and so on. I won't go through the argument, but uh, that closure actually maps to y. It certainly maps to an under phi, but the images all lie in y. And that map phi y is, is called the blow up of y. Uh, actually, maybe I will go through the argument. Um, so this is closed, right? Because phi is continuous with respect to some the Zariski topology. And it certainly contains the pre-image of the smaller thing. Now what that means is that, well, what's the pre-image of y under this, this map here, remember, just comes from sitting this inside a n cross p n minus 1 and then projecting. So the pre-image under phi uh, doesn't place any constraint on this, right? But it's, it's clear from the way that phi is defined that uh, phi inverse y so taking the closure only adds points in the points of this part Maybe takes a little bit of thought, but okay. Now we're ready to draw some pictures. Okay, so here, here is a n. That's my y. Try and draw a n cross p n minus one up here. Okay, so points up here are pairs consisting of points in a n and points in p n minus one. And I'm going to draw the p n minus ones. I'm going to try and draw uh, copies of p n minus one, kind of going orthogonally. But you're not meant to imagine them as well. There's no origin in Pn minus 1, right? Which makes drawing this picture a little bit awkward somehow. That's Pn minus 1, okay? It's meant to be a P1 there going vertically. The place where it meets An isn't sort of special, right? Because there's no, it's not like there's a zero here that I would match up with, with there. So don't assign much meaning to that intersection point but but nonetheless uh, maybe that's a useful idea okay so through every point here we have a copy of of p n minus one okay uh, so here's the projection map What are we doing when we take the pre-image? Well, as I've drawn it down below, I've sort of removed the origin from Y. Right? That's that open thing. And then I'm taking the pre-image upstairs, which is the same thing, right? It's kind of the same picture. Because remember, uh, Well, uh, let's 
let's see. Okay, let me take a point out here. Call that point P. There's a line that goes through P in the origin. That line is L. So A n cross P n minus 1 is somehow all these possible points. You pick a point in A n and then you and then you pick a, a corresponding make a choice in P n minus 1. When we go to the blow up, well, what choices are we allowed to make at P for the thing that goes in P n minus 1 when we're inside the blow up? of a n. Well, if p is not the origin, the only choice we have is l, right? So in fact, the thing that is in the blow up, so let me, the blow up stuff is going to be in blue. This point here, which is p l, is the point in the blow up. And if I call this q, Then there's another line, call it L prime, from Q through the origin. And the point that is in B that lies above Q is Q L prime. Okay, so somehow you you connect connect all these dots. But can you see what this is converging to here? There's a point here which is of the form zero comma something. What is the something that P comma L and Q comma L prime and so on, as I take these secant lines closer and closer to the origin, uh, that is converging to something there. So we'll come back to that. Now let me look on the other side. Let me take a point. Take me, let me take points. Uh, R and S. Just draw them in green. So that's going to be I don't know, M, M prime. So this is R comma M and S comma M prime. So as I come in this way along the curve, think about a, a sequence of points on the curve, S then R and getting closer and closer to the origin. As I do that, the secant lines have slopes that are approaching some fixed number. And it's a slope of a line that looks like that. And in fact, that line has slope uh, minus one. So this here is zero comma line, you know, uh, what should I call it? It's actually the equivalence class of the pair one minus one, if you like, line of slope minus one. Whereas if I approach from this direction, 
and imagine a sequence of points P then Q getting closer and closer to the origin. Well, the secant lines that I get approaching from that direction have slopes, slopes that approach 1. So this here is actually 0, 1, 1, line of slope 1. And this is the heart of the blow-up, what you've just seen here. Because those are both points in the closure, right? Of the pre-image of Y with zero removed. Both of those sequences, so P comma L and Q comma L prime and so on, those are points in the pre-image of Y with zero removed. And everything out here is in that pre-image. And hopefully I've convinced you that 0, comma, the line of slope 1 is the limit of that sequence and therefore lives in the closure. And similarly with 0, comma, the line of slope minus 1. So the upshot is that 0, line of slope 1 and 0, line of slope minus one both belong to the closure of the pre-image which is by definition the blow up of y at the origin and in fact that's it those are the only new points in the blow up of y that is they're the only points over zero they're the only points apart from the pre-image of y with zero removed itself which makes sense right they're the only points at the origin, the origin, so over the origin you just have this P, P1 in my picture, right? Um, uh, I guess I'm missing, mixing up the example in the general case a bit, sorry about that, uh, that was in my head because I introduced the example already. So in the case of the example, which is, is the picture I'm drawing, this nodal curve whose equation I gave a bit earlier, um, this is the case that, yeah, so... Uh, in the example the example being this one okay so in this example when we blow this up at the origin the points in the closure are exactly the limits of these sequences of points which show us that the the pairs that I show at the bottom of the left hand board are in the closure so the, the conclusion for this example is that the the blow up is, well, the stuff that just looks like y with zero removed, union those two extra points. So it was like this, right? That's blue stuff. That's green stuff. So you can see how the blow up has pulled apart this curve, which is singular at zero because its tangent space is not one dimensional. There's two ways of approaching zero that lie on the curve. It's pulled that curve apart at zero exactly by adding in somehow these lines of approach as points of the blow up and those are limits uh, lines of approach sort of literally right they're, they're sort of limits of sequences that approach zero um, in two different ways and yeah if, if you can manage to see what on the left hand board was sort of general uh, it's not important to draw a picture in the general case but somehow the general case looks like that right uh, you can it's a little bit more complicated to make a general statement about what a line of approach means uh, and so on, but uh, still an accurate intuition. Okay, let me think if there's anything more I wanted to say. Um, check I finished the definition of the general blow up. Blowing up a sub variety, let Y be a sub variety. Yeah, that's just the closure. And the... 
So is the closure together with this map? Somehow the, the blow up is really the map rather than the object. Okay, um, the relevance of blowing up to the broader discussion uh, is, a, is a bit lengthy, but so singular learning theory uh, is sort of organized around resolution of singularities. Res resolution of singularities can be done by uh, successively blowing up the original space together with the KL divergence and um, so this gives you some intuition, at least for the very simplest case of blowing up. You had originally planned to uh, go through the example in Watanabe's book, example 2.7, I think, which shows how uh, exactly this blow up of A2 at the origin uh, puts X squared plus Y squared into a normal form. Uh, but I think if I check the time, I'll see we've, yeah. Well, we're over time already. So I think I'll stop there and, um, and leave it to you to ask me some questions. Thanks, everyone.